do. Today, I will be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I will never be the same. I am about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. I will never be the same. Never, never, never. I will never be the same. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Today's encouraging word comes from 1 Chronicles 16. I'm going to read out of my Bible, which is not King James, so forgive me, but it's the New Living Translation. I'm starting at 16, uh, with chapter 16, and I'm starting at uh, verse 14. He is the Lord our God. His justice is seen throughout the land. Remember his covenant forever, the commitment he made to a thousand generations. This is the covenant he made with Abraham and the oath he swore to Isaac. He confirmed it to Jacob as a decree and to the people of Israel as never-ending covenant. I will give you the land of Canaan as your special possession. May the Lord have a blessing to the readers, hearers, and doers of his holy word. Amen to you all. Is everyone today? Praise God. I want you to turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 9. And we're going to start at verse 14. A lot of people have a lot of questions about fasting. What is the purpose of fasting? Does it accomplish anything? Does it help us? And that is what we want to talk about. You know, today is about fasting. Uh, while, you're, while you're turning there, I want to read one other scripture to you while you're turning there. And then I'll tell you where that scripture is located at. There's a passage of scripture. There's a passage of scripture in the New Testament who says that God has given us the keys to the kingdom. Okay? And that is found in Mark, I believe it's 18, between 17 and 20, something like that. But you can write it down, you can find it. But what does that mean? I have keys here in, in my hand. I have three different automobile keys on here. But one automobile key won't fit the other automobile. It's the key. Just like you have a lot of keys on your, you may have on your key ring. One will fit one door. You may have two locks. One will fit the top lock. One won't fit the bottom lock. When God said that he has given us the keys to the kingdom, I want you to understand that not every key will fit every door. You need to use a different key for different doors. The purpose of this teaching on fasting is because fasting is a key, okay? Decreeing the word of God, that is a decree. What you speak, decreeing, that is a key. Faith is a key. Trusting God is a key, okay? And in the passage of scripture I ask you to turn to, it reads as follows. And when he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them. Talking about Jesus, he just finished something. Now he's coming. He sees a great multitude around his disciples, all right? Gathering around them and scribes disputing with them. Immediately when he saw, when he, when, 
Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him and greeted him. Now understand this. Here comes Jesus. He sees a multitude of people around his disciples. So he's wondering, you know, what are you talking about? What's going on here? And now he's 17. Then one of the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I brought you my son, who was a mute spirit. And whenever it sees him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. He says, I spoke to your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Okay? He answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? In other words, he's rebuking the generation of people. He says, you know, because here Jesus is a man of faith. And he's watched so much lack of faith in people. Okay? We have that today. We have a lot of people that believe in God but have no real faith in God. You see, when we have faith, see, in a lot of places, our faith has been taught incorrectly. And let me clarify what I mean. People teach you to have faith in faith. But your faith should be in God. All right? Because see, it is God that is going to keep the promises that he has made to you. That's where your faith goes in. Okay? So, he says, Oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought him, they brought him to him. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed, convulsed him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. As soon as the spirit came in the presence of Jesus, it started doing his thing. Okay? And, I, and then he says, he, he asked the father, he says, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And often he would throw, throw him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. He says, the question was, if you can believe. All right. Anytime you use the word, that means if, that means it's up to you to decide whether you're going to or you're not going to. He said, but if you choose to, he says, all things are possible to them that believe. All right. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. He said he believes. But then he said this behind it. He said, help my what? Unbelief. He says, I can only believe to a point. He says, I can get to this point, but I can't get further. So he says, help my unbelief. See, a lot of times we think it's real spiritual when we're dealing with something and we know that our faith is not there to, to overcome. We feel it's spiritual not to just ask God, help me with my faith. But here you find a father that his child is at stake and his child is dependent on his faith. Okay? And he says, I, I, I just don't have it. It's just not there. But he has enough sense to say, help me with my unbelief. We're going to have to do the same thing. When we reach to a point point, we know we're at our limit, ask God to help you go further than that. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying, a saying to it death and dumb spirit I command you out of him I come out of him and enter no more and then the spirit cried convulsed, great, convulsed greatly and came out of him and he became one as dead in other words he passed out looked like he was dead alright and the people even said he is dead 27 but Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had come into the house, his disciples now asking him. You know, because remember, it started out, they took this boy to the disciples. The disciples was unable to deal with this spirit, all right? But now they see Jesus deal with his spirit, the spirit leaves. So now when he comes into the house, his disciples ask him, why weren't we able to do this? They probably did the same thing Jesus did, and the question was, why aren't we able to do this? And look what Jesus answers. 
So he said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but fasting and prayer. Prayer and fasting. There are things that you're going to deal with in your life that it's going to require for you to fast. Okay? The reason a lot of people don't want to fast is because that means you have to give up something that you become very used to. Eating. Eating. Okay? But fasting, we want to talk about it because there are some people that feel that fasting is not important, it's not necessary. Now, let me share this with you in the beginning. Whether you fast or not does not determine whether you go to heaven or hell. So, you know, you know that, that don't, don't think that it's a must that you have to fast. But there is a reason why you should fast. And that's what we want to talk about. First question I want to address is what is biblical fasting? What does it mean? to fast according to the Bible, all right? Biblical fasting can be defined as abstaining from food for spiritual reasons, for spiritual reasons. What does that mean? When you go into a fast, you should have a reason that you're fasting, a spiritual reason. If you don't have a spiritual reason when you fast, all you're doing is going on a diet, okay? You should have a reason, spiritual reasons, all right? I want you to turn now to Luke 4 and 1 because we're going to look at some scriptures where we see fasting in its operation, okay? Fasting means to sustain from food for a spiritual reason, all right? There are different types of fast, and we're going to talk about that. You know, and it's hard, you know, some of you have fasted, you know, and if you're like me, I fasted quite a bit, and then I got away from it, and I got further away from it, and further away from it. Now I'm fine, and go back to fasting, it ain't no joke, you know, it ain't no joke. I'm like, I'm like, man, man, I should have kept it up, you know, because there was a time in my life that I fasted two days every week, two days every week. But then we can become so comfortable with ourselves that we neglect what we're supposed to do. You know, things are good, you know. I mean, you know, the devil's still attacking, but he ain't throwing dynamite. You know, it's pot, you know, so you get you get lackadaisical, you get comfortable, you know, and and, and the pastrami's become addicting. That cheesecake, man, got your name on it. You know, you walk through the store. You know, it seemed like the moment, the moment you even think about fasting. You become hungry. You just finish eating, and you you just thinking about fasting. You like, wow, man. You know, in Luke four and one, we see that it says Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for forty days by the devil. And in those days, he ate nothing. He ate nothing, and afterward. When they had ended, he after the 40 days, he said he ate nothing. We're going to talk about this a little further on because, see, there are different types of fast. This is what is considered a supernatural fast where you're not eating any food, drinking any water. This is a supernatural fast. This is something that only God can call you on to do, okay? You on to do that, it, you know, you... you, you, you uh, a supernatural fast. Let me just leave it right there. We're going to talk about some other people that did 40-day fast in the Bible that didn't eat, and it says they didn't eat or they didn't drink, okay? Nehemiah. In the book of Nehemiah, chapter 1, verse 4, you don't have to follow me on these. I'll be glad to give you the scriptures afterward, but I need you to pay attention because I really want you to hear the different people and the different places where fasting was. So you can write them down however you want to do it, but please stay with me here because the reason that I'm teaching this, I want to pause right here, is this. Every year in this church for the last seven years, in January, we, did a, we do a 21-day fast. It's a Daniel's fast. That's every year for the last seven years, Okay. One of the things that I hadn't did and God showed me was to end my year with a short fast, all right? And we're going to see, I'm going to talk to you why we're doing this and why we should. To end my year with a short fast and then come into the 21-day fast. See, there are things that are happening in your life now that are spiritual. A 
attacks, addiction, bad habits, things that need to be broken now before you go into the new year, things you need to shake now, okay? See, you have, you, you, you have, you, you, I was watching a movie, and most of you know I, I like them sci-fi movies. And it was this one guy, man, you know, it was, it was this monster, and he was, if he bit you, you got contagious. It wasn't a vampire. So, so anyway, his buddy got bit, and his buddy ran in the door, and, and he was already, his other buddy was already changing. And so he had a choice. Let his buddy come in the door and he knew what was going to happen to him or close the door on his buddy. He did the wise thing. He closed the door on his buddy and looked through the window and watched his buddy change. See, a lot of us, we're not closing the door on those things that we need to close the door on coming into the new year. And we're letting them come into the new year and then we're trying to deal with them in the new year. And what happens, we can get them under control, but we don't get rid of it. We have to go through a process to get rid of it. Do you understand what I'm saying? So in the book of Nehemiah, we see that it says, so it was. When I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Now, what was happening with Nehemiah? Nehemiah, he wasn't a priest. He wasn't a prophet. He was a, just a regular man that had been put in a position. And there was a gentleman that came, and he asked them, how are the people doing from Jerusalem, the Israelites? And the man told him that it's, things are bad. Things are bad for them. And what he did, he went into a fast. He fasted and he prayed. What was he fasting and praying for? He was preparing the way because he was going to go to his employer and ask him for a leave of absence to go see about these things. And he, what he wanted was favor from God, okay? So it says, what did he do? He said he fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. David humbled himself for God to intervene because of injustice. Psalms 35, 13. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. For those of you who don't know what sackcloth is, it was what they would do. They would take something like, you know, we call it, just think about a gunny sack, you know. They would take that, put that on, and they would throw dirt and ashes on themselves, you know. That to them show humility, okay. So it says that my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled myself with fasting, with fasting, okay. And my prayer would, and my prayer would return to my own heart. In other words, he was seeking God on the behalf of other people, and he he went into a fast. Most of you know about Esther, all right. If I say the name Esther, mostly every woman knows Esther, you know, or either Ruth, you know, you got. I don't care. They know Esther or Ruth, okay? Well, Esther had an uncle that his name was Mordecai. And see, in Scripture, there is no parents mentioned for Esther. All right? So we don't know whether her parents died. We don't know what happened, but they're not mentioned. Mordecai is the one that is mentioned to raise her. So what happens? There becomes a, a, a decree by this very evil person that what is going to transpire is all the Jews are going to be killed. And look what it says in Esther 4 and 3. And in every providence where the king's command and decree arrived, there was great mourning among the Jews. This is a national fast. You know, we, 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 you've heard about the National Day of Prayer, where everybody all over there praying, you know. Well, this was a national fast. And it says, uh, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, and wailing. Notice it says, with fasting, weeping, and wailing. And many lay in sackcloth and ashes. Then we have where the early church prayed in the book of Acts, Acts 13 and 2. And it says, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted. Now notice, what does it mean to minister to the Lord? If somebody comes and ministers to you, what does that mean? They're basically taking care of you, all right? 
They're taking. So when we minister to the Lord, we do that by praise and worship. That's how we minister to the Lord. You know, we have become so indoctrinated that we always want the Lord to minister to us. But you'll see in many places, people minister to the Lord. That's what wor worship and praise is. When we're worshiping and praising, you're actually ministering to the Lord. If you read in, in, in Revelations, there are angels, and all these angels do all day, all night, that's all they do is say, holy, holy, holy art thou. They're ministering to the Lord. You see, you have to understand that God wants you to be able to minister to him, okay? What does that do? That shows respect and reverence. I mean, anybody does anything good for you, most likely we're going to say thank you. I really appreciate that. I know that many people say thank you to God, you know, but is your heart really in it? Is your heart really in it? Or are you just saying, oh, thanks a lot? You know, see, we have to take time and set time aside to worship and praise God. You know, because if you don't see him as God, if you don't see him as the creator of the universe, if you don't see God in that fashion, then you don't see God as you should see him. Do you understand what I'm saying? There are people that see the president of, our, uh, of the United States, but they don't have any respect for him. And I'm not talking about what he's done or what he hasn't done, but at least respect the office. Do you understand what I'm saying? At least respect the office. See, so when it comes to God, your worship, your worship is very important. You know, that's why God himself says that he inhabits the praise of his people. That's why in the Old Testament you see several different places that before they went to war, they sent the praisers out first. They went first. Praise and worship is very important. See, we talked about earlier about keys to the kingdom. Praise and worship is a key that opens up certain doors. So Acts 13, 2 says, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, notice, after they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit showed them something. The Holy Spirit said, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. They were fasting for direction. They knew about what to do with this situation. And after they fasted and ministered to the Lord, the Holy Spirit spoke up to them and said, separate Barnabas and Saul. He told them, these two are the ones that's going to do the work that I called. And now they were to be dispatched. But it didn't happen until after they fasted and prayed. A lot of you are looking for directions in your life. A lot of you want, you know, to, to, to understand, am I going the right direction? Am I doing the right thing? It only comes when you take yourself out of the situation and start to fast and pray. There was a job we were doing years back, and we had, we had a time limit to do this job. This particular company was open 364 days a year. It was a big plant. And they only shut down for a certain amount of hours for the cleanup. All right? So we, we were doing an electrical job and we had to cut the cement, locate it, pull the wires through, and re-pour all within a certain amount of time. But what happened was the location of it on the plans were wrong. So when we cut out, it wasn't there. And we said, oh, man, they don't put these wrong on the plans. But we still got a time limit. I called a very good friend of mine that is very experienced. Matter of fact, he taught me. And I said, this is the situation. This is what we're doing. He says, can you have them make sure and shut down everything right now? He said, shut down everything in that plant. And so I told him, I said, we need to have every machine, no sound, no nothing, shut it down. They shut everything down. Then he tells me, he says, send the snake. It's a, it's, it's a snake that you send through a conduit, all right? He says, send the snake. He says, once you get it about 100 feet, he says, start shaking it. 
and we did this. And when we started shaking, we heard it. And we followed the sound. And I, I'm on the phone with him. And I said, all right, I, I believe we got it. He said, now cut, have them cut four by four feet, and it's going to be right there. But now what I'm showing you is everything had to be shut down for us to hear. Fasting shuts everything down so you can hear. It's just like in that building. It shuts it down. Well, Pastor, I got family. I got this. Yes, you do. But in your fasting, you're going to learn that you're not, you're not going to be as intense and involved in certain things. You're going to be back and away from it. Okay? So just like the Holy Spirit spoke up during their fasting and praying, he will speak up to you during yours. Acts 14, 23. So when they appointed leaders in every church and prayed and fasted, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. It was after they, when they, they were picking elders of the church. An elder of the church is, is basically like a pastor, a person that's more seasoned. He said, they were selecting these people and how they selected this was to seek God through fasting and praying. Now, I want to talk about right and wrong motives for fasting. Here are some wrong motives for fasting to be seen by others. You just want people to know you fast. See, the Bible, you know, speaks about that in Matthew 6 and 18. You know, the critical issue is not whether people know you are fasting, but whether you want them to know you're fasting. See, that's a difference. You know, like you, you, you have where you, you uh, have a family that invites you, you know, to dinner, and you don't want to be insulting to them and say, no, I'm not going to come. So then at that point, you would say, hey, I'm on a fast. You would let them know I'm on a fast. All right. But you're not letting them know just because you want them to know oh, I'm fasting to make you seem more spiritual. OK, that's a wrong motive to be justified by God. See. In Luke 18, 12, and 14, there were two, two men. One said, I fast. Oh, he was, he, he, he was boasting. He said, I fast twice a week. He said, I fast twice a week. You know? And the other one said, God be merciful to me. But this one cat was saying, I'm better than you because I fast. See, that in itself is you trying to use fasting to justify you before God. Fasting does not justify you before God. What justifies you by, before God is what Jesus did. There's nothing you can do to do that. Then we have another wrong motive. Is people want to be approved by God, so they think by fasting they're going to get approval by God. That's wrong. Fasting doesn't give you approval by God. You know, in first, and you can look that up in 1 Corinthians 8.8. 8. You know, it, it, it says food will not commend us to God we are neither the worse if we do eat or the better if we don't it doesn't have anything to do with that fasting is something that you are seeking God for here are some right motives for fasting fasting for repentance okay and you have to understand what repentance is to repent means to change the way you think to change the way you think. That's what repentance means. Repentance means to turn, turn, turn away from it, okay? So when you repent, you're remorseful. You're remorseful for what you did. Some people, they want to repent because they're guilty, and guilt is bothering them. But in their heart, they have no real remorse for what they've done. They're not sorry for, and they turn around and they do it again and again and again, and, 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 and they immediately, God forgive me, God forgive me, God forgive me. Well, when is it going to come to the point that you're going to realize that you keep doing the same thing? Yes, God forgives you, but you got to come to a point that you are really so remorseful in your heart that you're going to say, Lord, I need you to work on this area in my life. 
So a right motive for fasting is, is repentance. Another one is spiritual strength against an enemy attack. Because, yes, you have learned to master certain attacks from the enemy. Okay, because you've grown like that. Most of you sitting here have been in this church for long enough that you got enough word that you can fight off certain attacks. But when other attacks come that you can't fight, this is when you have to go into your mode of fasting and praying. To break demonic bondage. This is another one. Just like you've seen, you seen, you seen with Jesus. You know, you've seen with Jesus. What did you see? He came back, and what the disciples weren't able to do, he was able to do, and he told them this kind, this kind only comes out by fasting and praying. Okay? This is what he said. Some translations, they, only, they don't use fasting. They just say, and praying. Okay? But it actually says fasting and praying. Okay? That means that you're not just praying, you're putting something else into this, all right? Because we see that example there. If you want to go to another level with, with God, if you want to do something more than what you've been, if you want something different from next year, you're going to have to do some different things. And I'm just going to be straight with you. Take your own mind back to 2015, December the 31st, 2015. If you can remember the resolutions that you made, all right? Then go to 2016. If you can remember the resolution, and see, the reason that many of you can't remember the resolutions is because you didn't make them. You, you, you couldn't keep them. That's, you know, you always, anything, any accomplishments you remember. But that's why you don't remember. 2016, 2017. You have to do something different this year to get something different. I told you fasting is not something that is mandatory. It's not something that, that, that you have to do to go to heaven. No, it is not. But it's something that you should do to move closer to God, to get, to get where God wants you to get. It's, it's getting a discipline over your body. That's what it is. It's gaining discipline over your body. Yes, them hamburgers look good. They look real good. I told you. I told you. Man, look here. I have, I've had some challenges in my fasting. You know, and I'm going to talk about, you know, what if you don't make the fast? Don't feel guilty. Pick it back up and keep going. I told you one time I was fasting. Somebody offered me it was some chips or something, and, and without thinking, without thinking, I said, yeah, man, give me some chips. And I put them in my mouth, and the moment I swallowed Jackie, the devil said, see there? You ain't spirit. And I said, I had forgot I was fasting. And I felt, and he rolled me that day. Look at you. Mm-hmm. You only went two days, and look at you. Now you, you're full of potato chips. I said, Lord Jesus. But I had to realize that wasn't God bringing that guilt on me. See, because, see, the Bible says in Romans 5 and 1 that there is no condemnation to them that believe in Christ Jesus. You got to understand that. Guilt always deals with your mind. Conviction always deals with your heart. Know the difference. God wants to always deal with your heart. Okay? So, to awaken yourself, another uh, uh, right motive is to awaken yourself for spiritual hunger. Okay? Another thing is to test and to see what desires control you? Because in doing your fast, it's going to be things that come out. And you might like, like what you see that come out, but they're being revealed to you so you can deal with those things. To demonstrate our love and desire for God above all things. It's like, Lord, look here. I'm putting my plate away because I desire to hear from you. Okay? I desire to be closer to you. See, that I told you in the beginning, a fast is sustaining for food, from food for a spiritual reason. And if you don't have an actual spiritual reason, you might as well eat because it ain't nothing but a diet. You might as well just chump it on down, okay?
Now let's talk about getting into a fast for beginners. Because a lot of you have never fasted, okay? And we want to talk about how you get into it as a beginner. You have to take progressive steps, all right? That helps our body to be accustomed to missing a meal. If you've never fasted before, you eat one or two or three meals or four or some of you five and six a day, your body is used to eating all them meals. You understand me? See, we eat even when we ain't hungry. Okay? I'm just give you an example. Yesterday, I know that we're going out to uh, my sister-in-law's and they cook all kind of food, everything. All right? I had to be here at the church for some things, right? I went past the pastrami high, Robin, knowing how much food going to be out there. And the next day, I wasn't hungry, but it was the pastrami house. I felt it was a sin to pass the pastrami house without getting the pastrami. <laughs> so I felt better by calling Bear and saying, hey, if I get one, can we split it? She said, yeah. I said, yeah, I feel better now. <laughs> <laughs> but see, the point I'm trying to show you is that I was not hungry. It was just the fact I, I just wanted it, all right? So for beginners, you're going to have to back off slowly, okay? What, do that, what does that mean? Maybe you'll start your fast by missing one meal a day. Maybe you'll have to go from 6 a.m. To, to, to 1 o'clock. You see what I'm saying? And then start taking it out further. How do you take it out further? All right, the next time I fast, instead of going from 6 to 1, I'm going to go from 6 to 5, from 6 to 6, all right? But you have to do it in steps, progressionally. That's what happens to a lot of people. We'll go on a three-day, a seven-day fast, and you've never fasted. You have all the, you, you in your heart, you want to go the whole seven days. This is what you're looking for. But you have never did it before. So you're able to get through most of the first day. By that night, it's just something about food. That night, it's on a, it's on a loud speaker coming through the refrigerator. Hey! You know, it's because your body's not used to it. You have to work your way into it. You don't start out if you've never fasted before unless God gives you that ability to go Three days, five days, seven days. You don't start out like that. And if there are some people that have been able to do that, but that was because God supernaturally sustained them. Okay? See, I've been on fast, 40 day fast. In my life, I've been on three. And God was the one that did that. But it got to a point that I didn't even think about food. Why? Because my body wasn't thinking about it anymore. I had juices and water. It wasn't just uh, uh, all, you know, without, without juice and water, all right? But after about 10 days, 10, 12 days, I was struggling. I was struggling for real. I was struggling for real, but it was, it was a few of us that went on this fast together, so I was able to be around other people that was not eating, wasn't talking about food, okay? So I was able to be around people like that, but I was in a struggle. But then after I reached a certain limit for that length of period of time, it didn't, it, it wasn't a thought period because now my body was used to not doing that. It was used to drinking water. It was used to drinking juices, okay? There are certain things that you're going to have to do before your fast. You know, you need to prepare yourself mentally that you're not going to eat. You're going to have to start talking to yourself. I'm going to eat one meal a day. I'm not going to eat no meals a day. You're going to have to prepare yourself mentally in order to go through this and do this. Okay? You know, you have to. It's a preparation to fasting that we have to. But why? It's because it's something that we're not used to. It's something we're not accustomed to. There are certain people that do this on a regular basis. They don't have to become mentally prepared. It's just that they know they're going to fast from this period to this period. You know, why? It's because they do it on a regular basis. All right? Take, for instance, um, if you had to jog. Some of you may jog, some of you may not. Okay? If you like me, you do not. All right? <laughs> but it's, let's say that, you know, uh, 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 all right, 
I want to use. I always use us. I will use me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> she back then. Ah, you ain't gonna use. We went out and you know, we was gonna start walking. Just one part. It's a big walk around this park, right? And so. I'm, you know, used to back in the day, you know, I, I, I could do a little bit, you know what I'm saying? I mean, so I had purpose in my mind. I want to do me like eight, nine laps around this, and this big. You know, I, I'm going to start out. Now, I had it all in my heart to do this, Rob. I was ready for eight, nine laps. Man, around four laps, man, everything in my body, my legs was hurting. I was, and I was trying to play it off. <clears throat> and then I stopped by the bench. And act like I was checking my shoes. <laughs> and I was like, my God. You know, everything was hurting. Why? Because I wasn't used to that. You know, around that, the, the, the next bed, she had parked it a lap or two before this. And I'm going to keep on going and try to prove something. Man, I got back around that house. Are you ready to go? She said, yeah. I said, yes, go. Let's go. It was because I was trying to do more than I, my body would allow me to do. All right? Then when we started to go back, we did like three or four laps. It was easy. And we built up to like six, all right? But I tried to take on more than I should have when it happened. And I'm trying to talk to you about this because sometimes we'll do that with our fasting. So before fasting, make sure you prepare yourself mentally. Now let's talk about doing a fast. During a fast, you should spend the time that you would normally for meals. You should spend that time to pray and to seek the Lord. When you're on a fast, don't spend that extra time you have sitting there looking at TV, doing all of that. We're going to get into that later on. You should spend it in the Word. Um, we were talking uh, just this morning, and as we were talking, the Lord reminded me there were some areas in my life that I needed to really strip away from me, and he said, he showed me how I did it. During my fast, I would read the Psalms. I would read the Psalms during my fast. I, I would just read the Psalms, all right? And that helped me because it was the Word of God that gave me strength, okay? Because remember, Jesus said, I have food that you know not of. He was talking about the word of God will give you the strength. Now, not only starting a fast is important, ending a fast is important. Okay? When you go and you end your fast, you got to the next morning. Yeah, buddy, you just, that's all you think about. And the next morning, you want to go cook bacon, eggs, hash, brown, toast, juice. You understand me? Danish. You fit in the feast. That's the worst thing you can do. Okay? But why? It's because your body, your body is not used to the food that you're getting. All right? You don't go stuff yourself. Your body is really going to go into shock. You have to gradually do that, and especially if you've gone more than three days, five days, you need to start eating something light, like a soup, okay? Eat something like a soup, because you're gradually getting your body back into accepting what it has been rejecting. Another worst thing that you could do during a fast is put some gum or mint in your mouth. I'm trying to tell you, because gum and mint have sugar. And when you chew it, your body says, oh, shoot. Oh, this is what I'm talking about. Yes, go ahead. Okay, well, you have to do it. See, now, now she brought up a good thing. She said she has to do it because her sugar gets low. And that's a good point she brought up. There are some of you that have medical reasons that you have to readjust your fast. Okay. You have to readjust your fast. There's some of you that have conditions that you have to eat. Okay? Well, you need to eat. Why? It's because it's a medical condition. Don't be stupid. All right? Don't be stupid. Hear me. You have to eat. Now, how do you do now? Now what you're going to have to do, you know that normally you eat, 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 and eat. So cut it down. Cut it down. Back up of what you're eating. Back it down. 
All right? You used to eating uh, 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 hamburgers, french fries, and a shake. You understand me? Why don't you just go for the french fries? You see what I'm saying? Leave the shake alone. Go for the french fries and some water. All right? You have to eat. Get you some fruit and some water. All right? See, you have to do what you have to do in moderation. Because why? Right now, your body is in need of that. That's a medical condition. And for those of you that don't have no medical medical condition, don't be trying doing the fast. Talking about, I think I got a medical condition. <laughs> Question. Yeah, the Daniel fast you get to eat, and that's what we're going to talk about in just a moment. The different types of fasts. Okay. That's the one we do in January. Yes. Okay. Question is. Does fasting actually help you? Yes, it does. What will it do? It'll lead you into certain truths about yourself, about what God is revealing to you. Okay? It convicts us of sin. And what is sin? Sin means missing the mark. All right? Doesn't mean that you just out blatantly doing crazy stuff. It just means missing the mark. It'll show you in some areas of your life that you need readjustment in. Okay? It could be anger. All right? It shows you, it reveals that to you. But you know what? Let me share this too. When these things are revealed to you, there is something you need to do about it. God will give you the strength. Just don't let it be revealed and don't do anything. You know what that's like? That's like driving down the street and they tell you it's a dead end street. And you see the sign and you still won't get up off the gas. Well, it's inevitable that you're about to have a wreck. So this is why it's so important. Fasting also brings us into the presence of God. Now understand this. I want to share this with you. Because many of you, you have to deal with the public. You work. When you're fasting, your spirit is open. And if you go two, three days, you may be short-tempered. Short I'm going to tell you that now. That's why you don't get into debates. You're going to have to remove yourself from people. You're going to say, you know, even if you have to say, you're absolutely right. Leave. Because when you fast, you become wide open. Okay? And I mean short-tempered, especially when you go more than three days. It's like somebody said, good morning. You, what you say? <laughs> <laughs> You're like, what? You know? I mean, you know, so you're going to have to recognize that and be as more loving than you are right now, okay? <laughs> Fasting also accomplishes giving us wisdom, wisdom from God, okay? In fasting, it shows humility. It shows that we're humbling ourselves before God. I know most of you, if not all of you, remember Jonah. When he, the one that was in the, uh, the great fish's belly. Okay? Well, when Jonah finally took the message to Nineveh, all the people in Nineveh, they fasted. And what that fasting did, it turned the judgment of God. It turned the judgment of God. They came together all on one accord and fasted. Fasting helps you seek God's face more. You know, it also puts you in a place that you can really ask God for your desires. Because remember, the Bible says that God will bring your desires to pass. In Psalms 37, I believe it is. It says God will bring your desires to pass. But your desires, I don't care, you know, your desires are really desires that God has placed in your heart. Okay? And in that, with that being said, he wants those desires to come to pass, but you have to know how they are to come to pass. You may have one way of doing it. God may have another. You want his way. We fast to know God's will, all right? Yes, yes, yes. I know the Bible, you know, some going to say, well, doesn't the Bible tell us God's will? Yes, he does. Yes, it does. But let me ask you this question. Would we agree that Jesus himself would know God's will? 
I hope we agree on that. Well, remember when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he was praying that this cup be taken from him? He knew, he knew what his assignment was, but he was asking God, is there another way? Is there another way that this can be fulfilled? You see, just like the people in Nineveh, when the people of Nineveh came together and fasted and prayed, it turned the judgment that was going to be due them away. There may be things in your life that you, by fasting, will turn away without even knowing. Okay? Some of the names I'm about to mention right now, you may not even have heard of, some of you may, but these are great men of God that fasted, all right? And I wanted to mention them, and it's, and it's recorded on their fasting. I wanted, to mention, I wanted to mention them is because we dealt with people that were in the Bible. Let's look at some people that were not in the Bible that fasted. Martin Luther. Martin Luther was very popular in the early 1800s very popular man of God okay John Calvin is another one very popular when I say popular I'm not talking about these men were used to change some courses all right when the uh, reformation with the Catholics and different things these men were used by God to do these things you have John Knox and this is something that was quoted about John Knox from Queen Mary. Knox fasted and prayed so much that Queen Mary said she feared his prayers more than all the army of Scotland. That's what she said. That was her statement. Because she seen the life of a praying and fasting man. John Wesley, the renowned English preacher, he was a, a missionary and a founder of the Methodists. Methodist Church. He was the founder of the Methodist Church. All right, fasted twice weekly, from sunup until late afternoon. Charles Finney. He was a revivalist in the early 1800s. Fasted regularly for a week, and often and often would go three days without eating when he felt any pull spiritually on him. Okay. Another one, Bill Wright. He was the president of Campus, uh, uh, Campus Crusade for Christ. Like I said, some of you may have heard of these names, some of you haven't. But the names that I'm mentioning to you are people that have, pray, have played an important part that God has used them in the Christian walk. Okay? What we look at, we look at here we are in 2018. But you know what? You don't realize what it took for you to get to this point in your Christian walk in 2018 just like you know we have people that talk about you know the civil rights movement you know well we talk about what Rosa Parks had to pay you know the different people Everest and people like that we talk about that but it was their cost that brought us here the people that I'm mentioning to you are people that paid a great price for us to have what we have right now One thing is don't become legalist about fasting. You know, and what do I mean legalist? That you, you know, Friday is my fast day. And you don't have no real reason to fast. You know, don't become legalist. Don't become locked up behind fasting, okay? Don't put pride in the fasting where you just want to announce that, you know, you're fasting. You know, I have people that, you know, I talk to. You know, I pray three hours a day. I pray five hours a day. You know, and I'm like, man, that's good for you. You know, but they're not saying it in a way that they're acknowledging God. They're saying it because you, they want you to notice what they're doing. All right? You know, and I told one gentleman, I said, well, praise God. I ain't got to pray like that. <laughs> he might need you to pray like that. You know, I get mine in. You know, so you got to remember, it's not about being prideful about what you do. You know, one person may read 18 chapters a day of the Bible. And because they tell you every day I read 18 chapters, don't become, don't become convicted behind that. 
that person may have time to read 18 chapters. You might get up at 6 o'clock in the morning, got time enough for a coffee, and run out the house. Two scriptures on your phone at lunchtime. But that doesn't make you less a person that loves God than them. So don't get trapped up behind that. You know, we in the body of Christ have to stop challenging each other with our own individual behavior. You know, just like the person I told you, tell him he pray four hours a day. And I, and I said to myself, I said, shoot, something must be in your life. You got to pray that long, bro. You understand me? You know, really, I don't know what God is doing with him. You see what I'm saying? But I'm not going to become, there was a time I would become convicted behind that. Man, praise God. Now for our Facebook and family and friends, we want to thank you for tuning in. And this is us for today. God bless you. Have a blessed day. Amen. Amen. Because Linda's about to hand everybody a piece of paper. All right? Everybody's about to get a piece of paper, and then I'm going to go over these things.